Good morning. morning. Hope everyone is doing well today. Not a whole lot of particular announcements going on. Uh, Today we have uh, John 3.16 as the featured gospel uh, lesson. And uh, basically we're looking at just the idea of uh, kind of the flip side of what is it, what are, what are you saved from? What, uh, what has Jesus actually done? Uh, what's the, the thing that uh, Jesus gives you? What, what, what does eternal life look like in comparison to the alternative? And uh, the reason why we're looking at it is because it doesn't come out in English as well as it otherwise could. And so I'm going to try to make it clear from the Greek to see, okay, what, what the, uh, the actual meaning is. And, and they help us understand the gravity of the, the situation. And uh, hopefully that will be of spiritual benefit for us, especially during this time of Lent. So uh, we begin then focusing on what Christ did for us with the opening hymn, Alas, and did my Savior bleed.
Almighty God in His mercy has given His only begotten Son to die for each and every one of you, and for His sake He forgives you all your sin. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by His authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We continue now on page... Of course, it's going to stick. Um... 156. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, your mercies are new every morning, and though we deserve only punishment, you receive us as your children and provide for all of our needs of body and soul. Grant that we may heartily acknowledge your merciful goodness, give thanks for all your benefits, and serve you in willing obedience through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The Old Testament reading for this fourth Sunday in Lent is from Numbers chapter 21. From Mount Hor they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Adom. And the people became impatient on the way, and the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness, where there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food? Then the Lord sent fiery servants among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. By the way, in Hebrew, fiery serpent means a venomous snake. And uh, the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away these servants from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. This is the word of our Lord. The epistle is from Ephesians chapter 2. And you were dead in the trespass and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passion of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love which, with which he had loved us, even when we were in our dead and our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise as we sing together the Lent verse. according to St. John, the third chapter. Jesus said, 
as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his deeds have been carried out in God. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Together we confess the Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed on page 158. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and is set into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one in baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The John 3.16 in uh, Greek, uh, not going to go hugely into it, but it's uh, basically that, uh, yeah, when, when God is, is giving his, his son, and he talks about... Uh, Agape sin. God loved, that's the past tense of agape, uh, to love. Hothi uh, Austan Cosmon, God there. God loved the world so much uh, that Ton Huion Ton Monagene Edoken, He gave his one only begotten son. In a pas ho pisterion ace of Ton me. Apo Leitai Al Eche Zoin Iona. So that all everyone who is a believer in him should not apoletai, should not literally, not just simply perish, but literally be wiped out of existence. Um, but Eche to have uh, Zoin Iona eternal life. And uh, we see this. Apo, apolumi verb in, uh, then in Matthew uh, where it says do not fear the one who can simply kill uh, and uh, the, the verb here uh, means literally to make, make you stop being alive make you stop being a living being uh, do not fear the one that can only kill the body uh, and not the soul, uh, but rather fear uh, the uh, the one with the power 
uh, that who can who can uh, destroy uh, both soul and body in Gehenna. And again, we have this, this Apollome verb. So what is this verb to destroy? In the active sense, God does the destroying of the body and the soul in Gehenna, that is the fiery hell. Uh, this, this verb is more than just to like disintegrate, to break into your parts, to, you know, it's not like you're breaking something. It's literally you're wiping it out of existence. What we see then uh, in Revelation is that God the Father with God the Son are the cause, the beginning, the first cause of the new creation. Uh, whereas only God the Father is the first cause of the first creation. God the Son is the agent, the Logos, that brings it about. So um, what it says, this, this, this verb, apolume, which is an old verb, it has a me ending on it. It's an old Indo-European verb. Uh, the only verb, like for example, the Greek verb, amy, means I am. And uh, the only English verb that's a cognate to any kind of me verb is I am, literally the, the, the verb I am. That's, that's, and in many languages, that's the only old type of verb like this. These, these verbs are very old. You can find them in Sanskrit. And this verb literally means to blot out of existence, a polyme. And it's used to show what happens to those who are condemned. And uh, because both Christ and the Father are the, the first cause of the new creation, literally what being condemned for eternity means that you are literally transferred to a reality where God essentially ceases to have any connection with you. Uh, right now, we all are living in an existence where God is the creator, where we have some kind of connection to him, where he is bestowing upon us some kind of good gifts each and every day, and where even the just and the unjust receive his blessings. The rain falls, as scripture says, on the, the just and the unjust. The, the good gifts of God come to both the evil and the good. However, when the final day of judgment happens, then those who have joined together with Satan and the wicked angels are sent to a fiery burning hell that perpetually destroys them. Uh, literally, they are taken away from the cause and effect of creation that we know and are now kind of sent to a different dimension, an alternate reality, where they are stuck eternally uh, and never to return. And it it's, uh, should be a sobering thought that that is what Jesus came to save us from. He didn't come to save us from you know, being yelled at or criticized or even suffering, per se. He came to save us from being wiped out of existence, to be so thoroughly destroyed that there isn't a speck of us left. Because there is a Greek verb that uh, says to destroy something in the sense of break it down into its component parts or break it into little pieces or disintegrate it or what have you. This is not that verb. This is the verb that means to destroy so thoroughly that there's nothing left. That's, that's what happens to those who are condemned to perdition. Uh, that's why we call it perdition, the, the state of being eternally lost. It is, it is more than, than just um, a bad thing. It's, it's literally changing your existence so that nothing good can happen. Uh, we see this word to be lost, perdition or what have you, that uh, comes from Latin, of course, but it appears in words like, you know, pont perdu, which is the French version of French toast. It's actually a richer version of French toast than the American version because it uses a baguette or brioche and it uses cream in the custard to make it nicer. Uh, but the reason why they call it pont perdu is the idea of they're saving the lost bread 
That is to say, the French bread that has gone so stale you can't eat it anymore because it's hard as a rock by soaking it in custard and then cooking it and making it usable again. Uh, so we have this idea of something kind of going bad, I guess, when it comes to being so-called lost or perished. But the verb of polymy is so much more intense than that. I mean, when we think of the, they shall not perish is the translation of a polemy in John 3.16. Well, they shall not, what, die? Well, physical death does not separate you from God. Physical death, true, is, is a result of sin, but God still connects to those people who have departed this life in faith. God is still part of your life even after you're done with your life. God is important, and and... We often, we often forget how present God is in our lives. We often forget how big of a part God plays in our lives. And God is in our lives all the time. He's in our lives when we're asleep. He's in our lives when we wake up in the morning. The, the fact that creation isn't literally disintegrating into chaos around us is the result of God's good and gracious will to hold all things together for our benefit. God is being so very loving and kind to us each and every day. We forget about that. And we are saved so that we never have to face the reality of being ripped out of time and space and thrown into a place that we never want to go. And uh, we have that, for example, with the parable with Lazarus. Lazarus uh, is this poor guy. He, he passes away, but he is translated to the, the bosom of Abraham, so to speak. Father Abraham is there with him. He's there amongst the company of the saved. And he, who has suffered so much during his life, finally is at peace. And then you have the rich man who winds up being in Gehenna. And he, he says, Father Abraham, you know, send some water my way. I'm thirsty. It's, it's burning hot here. No can do. There's this impassable gulf between me and you. You're, you're, you're there now. Um, well, tell, tell my relatives to, you know, have Lazarus come back and tell my relatives to, no, don't do what I did. He, he, he said, well, they've got Moses and the prophets. In other words, they've got scripture. Follow scripture. And that is sufficient to tie them by. Uh, you know, to tie them over and, and, and help them understand what, what good is and what evil is. See, the thing is, we're not saved simply to do whatever we want to. We're saved to do good deeds in God because it is always the world's intention and uh, inclination to do evil. And good deeds are not evil deeds. There's a difference between the two. And, uh, you know, we, we need to be careful about this. Uh, we need to understand that there's a difference and that the world does not like what Christ has to offer. Because right after saying that Christ came into the world to save it and not condemn it, what does Christ say? He says, well, you know what? The light has come into the world, but the world loved the darkness. Okay? And the world is literally hell-bent on the darkness and the deeds of darkness. You know, and and uh, I, you know, I shouldn't have to stress this as, as a fact, but you know, this past week, for example, the president of our Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, sent out a letter to all congregations and what have you. We've got it via email. If you want to look at it, I can send it out. But uh, the uh, so-called Equality Act that was passed by the House of Representatives, what did it do? Well, what we see is they, they're wanting to take away the, uh, any kind of exemptions of conscience from medical caregivers regarding the availability of abortions and, and uh, euthanasia and things like that. Uh, you know, and and uh, they also are going to force any institution that receives any kind of federal aid for various reasons uh, to have to accept the, the homosexual transgender agenda. And this is going to have a direct effect on many K-12 through Missouri Synod schools 
as well as our colleagues and universities. And this is the first time, should this uh, bill come out of the House and not be changed in the Senate, uh, this is the first direct threat on the federal level to our church of this magnitude since the failed Blaine Amendment of 1876. And of course, this is nothing new. Uh, for example, I've got this uh, pamphlet called Communism and Socialism. And it was, this is the second edition from 1886. It was written by Ferdinand Walter, the first president of the Missouri Synod. It was owned by Alfred M. Raywinkle, himself uh, a professor both at Concordia in Edmonton, Alberta, as well as in St. Louis. And it chronicles, even during the 19th century, the efforts of socialists to attack the church. And uh, so people have been around a long time going after the church. It, this is nothing new, but the fact is we have the opportunity now to contact our representatives and our senators and let them know they need to stand up for uh, what's right and to not take away the First Amendment rights of people to have the ability to express what scripture says is true and not impinge upon their rights. Uh, Mark Luther and our Lutheran Confessions write that uh, you know, we do have a duty as Christians to obey the laws of the government, but at the same time, if they tell us to sin, if they say we have to sin, then we have to obey God rather than man. And we do it in a very kind and loving way, but uh, nevertheless, uh, we have to be prepared to understand that what the world wants leads to this apology, this destruction that Christ talks about, both in John and in Matthew. And Luther gives us uh, counsel from his own famous hymn, Ein feste Boys und Gott, and his final stanza, Nehmen Sie den Leib, gut erkennen Weib, das Farben dahin, Sie haben kein Gewinn, das Reich muss uns so bleiben. If they take our life or our bodies away from us, if they take away our goods, if they take away our reputation, if they take away our children or spouse, let it, let it, let it be. Uh, but they've won nothing. They've won nothing because the kingdom remains ours, and it must remain ours forever. Why? Because Christ came to die on the cross to save the world, not to condemn the world, which means that his victory on the cross and his victory at the tomb means that he is coming back and he is setting things to right. Even if things are a little chaotic now, even if people are going after churches for various reasons, it's going to be okay in the long run. Because God sets limits to what evil can do. Whether it's here and now or whether it's at the end of the world, there is going to come a time when God makes that choice. You are going to go amongst those who have eternal life, and you, are the, you other ones are amongst those who are going to go away to destruction. Eternal destruction, eternal death. Because death means being separated from God. And it, it matters to do what Scripture says. However, again, we stress that we do not use arms, or we do not use violence, or we do not use other means. Remember to him, rise to arms with what? With prayer, employ you. O Christians, lest the foe destroy you, for Satan has designed your fall. Will God's word, the weapon glorious, against all foes be thus victorious, for God protects you from them all. Fear not the hosts of hell, here is Emmanuel, hail the Savior. The strong foes yield to Christ our shield, and we, the victors, hold the field. It's not our job to make a lot of noise and a lot of fuss. We realize that the world is going to pursue the church. We realize that the world is going to love those evil deeds rather than the good because Jesus himself says that right after he says he's come to save us and not condemn us. You know, he literally says, look, I'm coming to save everybody and you're still going to hate me for it. 
but that's okay. I'll save who I can. I'll reach whom I can. I'll do what I can while I can be able to, to save you guys. That's how in the tank God is for us. Even we who love the darkness are still his friends. Even we who don't deserve his forgiveness are still forgiven. Instead of being wiped out, blotted out, destroyed, removed from time and space and the causality thereof, we are given a forever home in God's house. We are made part of Christ's family. We are made one of his own. And the things that we do are in God. It is not the church's place to be political. It's not the church's place to set policy. But it's the church's place to do what Scripture says. And our Constitution has guaranteed us the right to do what Scripture said. So we're not out to tell anyone what to do or how to think or what have you. We're simply saying, look, it is our freedom to do what Scripture said. That's all we want. That's all we want. You know, we're not going to go after anybody. We're not going to go hurting anybody. You know, but if we say things that people don't like, well, they have the right to say things that we don't like. That's, that's what the whole First Amendment was about. Lest these rights crumble before our eyes, the time is now because Satan is not slacking off. And, you know, if the president of our denomination has to send out a cautionary message about it, it's probably something we should be concerned about because it can affect potentially the, the thousands of people's lives. And all we can do is pray. We can put it into Christ's hands. And we can let people know that we follow Scripture. And that's important to us. And that will be important to us at the ballot box. And, uh, you know, leave it in God's hands. And whatever we do, we will continue to follow Scripture. We will continue to hold fast to the one who has come to forgive us and not condemn us. To the one who has come to give us eternal life and not this destruction being devoted to eternal perishing. So all we can do is pray that God and His Holy Spirit work through the Word to continue to preserve what we can do while it is still day. It's all in God's hands, and that's the way it's going to stay. But thanks be to God that he has come to save us, to forgive us, and not condemn. Thanks be to God that he offers hope and not despair. Thanks be to God that while we were yet his enemies, he loved us. Because we do not deserve his goodness, nevertheless he gives it to us anyway. How wonderful and good is that? That's a message that we can remember now to, to give us joy in the midst of all that's going around right now in the secular world. And uh, it's something that will sustain us throughout our lives because we have a forever home in Christ Jesus. And the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the one true faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God, for all according to their needs. We uh, remember all of those who are recovering from procedures or dealing with chronic pain or struggling with cancer or living in institutional settings or um, just dealing with a number of different issues and uh, whether they are of the body or of the spirit. Lord, we ask you to be with them, to, to strengthen them, to give them uh, your recovering uh, healing, if it so be your will, and otherwise to be their companion upon their road and give them hope uh, despite anything that's going on, knowing that there will come a time when they will be healed from all of these adverse conditions and that you will complete the promises that you have begun through their baptism in Christ Jesus, and we ask you then to strengthen them, heart, mind, spirit, so that they might continue to find joy amidst any physical travail that they might be suffering. Lord, in your mercy. We ask that your divine guidance and protection be with all who are in need of it, 
especially remember our military and their families, our first responders, uh, all caregivers, especially those caring for the uh, uh, people suffering from COVID. We ask you to be with all of our public officials at this time and, and let them remember that you indeed are the one who is the foundation and source of all good things and uh, give them the strength to, to trust and, uh, and do according to your gracious and good will so that uh, we are not forced to do wicked things but rather that we can continue to follow scripture uh, as, as our founding fathers have intended. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. We ask that you be with uh, all who are in need of you, who are calling upon your name. We especially uh, ask that uh, you just continue to bless us, to equip us to go forth and tell people about the love that you have for us that uh, Christ came not to condemn, but to save, and to, in so saving, lead us towards deeds that are in you, and uh, not those that are uh, in the way of darkness. So, so that way, we can start our eternal lives now and uh, prepare for the revelation of the world to come. Lord, in your mercy. For these and all other prayer concerns that may be in our hearts, Lord, we set them before your throne of grace, trusting in your mercy through Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue now with the service of the sacrament on page 160. Please rise. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should in all times and all places give thanks to you. Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who overcame the assaults of the devil and gave his life as a ransom for many, that with cleansed hearts we might be prepared joyfully to celebrate the Paschal Feast in sincerity and truth. Therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we, Lord, and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Savior, with repentant joy we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful, the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he gave thanks, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same manner also he took the cup after supper. And when he gave him thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the remission of all your sins. This do as often as he drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy we would, you would strengthen us in faith, the same faith toward you, and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Amen. 